Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last Science in Action seminar series. Um, uh, our last speaker, Jason Williams, will actually tell you a little bit about his story and a little bit uh, about kind of what he's doing. I know him a little bit better than maybe I know some of you because I had a class with him. He's one of my favorite instructors in that class. And so with that, I will leave it uh, for you, Jason. And uh, thanks very much, Nick. That's very generous. <laughs> and uh, welcome to everyone that's able to join here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. I have a couple slides. And feel free to uh, you know, ask questions at any time. You can throw them in the chat. If I miss them, then uh, get to them once I get to the end of the presentation. OK. Um, so this talk is going to be about education, and I've thrown in a little bit about my story. Uh, I'm on my uh, house Wi-Fi here, so not only is there like a train next door or internet or whatever, so if any time I'm unclear or the video fades or whatever, just uh, go ahead and yell at me until we correct the issue. All right, uh, so I wanted to talk about uh, some of the work about that I'm doing now, and uh, you know, that relevance to sort of where I came to. Uh, I'm at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. I guess I will talk a little bit more about that uh, when I get through the uh, through various parts of the talk. Uh, but again, thanks to Nick and others for, for inviting me and for hosting this. Um, so I actually graduated um, from my undergraduate in 2004 uh, at Stony Brook University in biology. And that's uh, actually on Long Island as well. Uh, so about two, 20, 25 miles from Cold Spring Harbor, actually on the same street, but down, down the road a bit. I lived a little bit south of the lab uh, all my life where I am. And I immediately went um, from graduation in, uh, into working at Cold Spring Harbor in a plant biology lab. Now, it, as it, I guess it's important to note that my entire time during uh, undergraduate I was working at, uh, you know, in, an, in a lab at the undergraduate uh, or as an undergraduate. So when I first came in as a freshman uh, to university, I got a job that summer in um, the life sciences in the ecology department. And I guess I, well, I guess in my mind, I started on the fifth floor, which is the top floor of the biology building is ecology and evolution. And I thought to myself, well, I'll try everything and I'll sort of work my way down. So I'll start from the fifth floor and, um, you know, go down the stairs, you know, the, maybe the next year is uh, I think neuroscience is the next, next uh, level down and then cell molecular and so on and so forth. Um, true to form, I just stayed in the place I was and I worked as an undergraduate uh, researcher um, my, my, my four or so years at Stony Brook University. Um, so when I went to Cold Spring Harbor, I then um, got a job and started working as a lab technician in plant sciences. Uh, my, per, my PI, or my pr principal investigator, so the person who ran the lab, was a very nice guy, um, moved to Georgia, and I was not going to move to Georgia with him. Uh, it can happen, uh, so this is good information for anybody who's thinking about what lab life is like. Uh, he, he, his wife actually was working with us. Um, she had her own lab and own space, but as a family, they decided that they wanted to move. Um, and so when that happens, and it does, uh, some people who are more tied to the lab, maybe they're doing their graduate work. Some of them might stay behind and complete that work. Some might go with them to complete that work. Same thing if you're a postdoctoral fellow. There's all sorts of different situations. Basically, everybody has to make a choice and I decided to stay. Um, so I stayed at Cold Spring Harbor, and I also uh, then worked in the cancer center, doing something completely different in some sense, um, working in that case on, on uh, prostate cancer. I did that for a little while, and then I came to the DNA Learning Center, which is another uh, component of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Um, so if you will note there, there are things that I did not do, maybe that I, um, I don't know if I plan to, and who knows what I'll do in the future, but I did not actually go for a PhD in biology, which, you know, I could have. Uh, in fact, there's a graduate school at Cold Spring Harbor. Um, so maybe my first message, if I'm talking anything about myself and 
most of this talk will not be about me. So if it's boring you, you can, you know, get through the next two, three minutes. But I've had an amazing opportunity to really do a lot of things with the education and the background that I had. So I just wanted to kind of maybe put the message first that um, education is important and, you know, different credentials are important and, and, you know, but they're not necessarily the limiting factor. You can do a lot of stuff. Um, so, oops, I skipped over the stuff that I've done. Um, I'm not keeping records, but I do keep records because I have to report on uh, metrics. So I've taught um, bioinformatics um, to, you know, thousands literally of graduate students and postdocs and faculty at more than 80 institutions. So I've had actually, not, none of this actually, in fact, none, none of that did I go to school for. Uh, so it was, in some sense, it was a little bit part of my undergraduate degree that I um, worked with computers and did bioinformatics slightly. Um, but I learned a lot of this stuff or taught a lot of this stuff to, uh, stuff to me. Probably you would not find very many bioinformatics PhDs uh, as you're going towards the time when I was in school and if I had decided to go straight to graduate school. So there wasn't much of that, um, much more now. And actually one of the things I do is try to make more of that. Um, but I've literally traveled the world. Um, in the last couple of years, it would not be uncommon for me to have a 100,000 mile um, travel uh, log behind me in a given year going to different institutions in the US and beyond to do trainings and workshops and things like that uh, in this area. So hmm. um, the other thing that I would say starting out about me is, um, and especially in, if this just happens at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, I'll talk a little bit, I guess, about it later uh, as an institution. Um, but one thing I've learned is that if you have a good idea, speak up about it, right? Um, because you'd be surprised that sometimes people actually listen to good ideas. Um, so Cold Spring Harbor has a really big history um, in science. And one of the things it's known for, um, for scientists is the meetings and courses that we have at Cold Spring Harbor. Um, so these are meetings and courses that have launched areas of, of science that have uh, launched careers. Uh, one of the metrics that they keep is the number of years between a course uh, and, and people who finish courses and uh, who might get a Nobel Prize from work that started in the course. So there's lots of things connected to courses. And I thought at some point, hey, you know what? We don't have a data science meeting here. And that was starting to become a thing. And so I just told people and they were like, yeah, you're right. And we have a data science meeting now uh, that's been going since, um, oh, I have to look at that. I think maybe 2008 might have been um, the first year. So we've done that. Um, I also still teach uh, high school. Uh, so one of the things that I um, had wanted to do, I had a great high school biology teacher, Mr. McGrann, if he's listening to this video out there somewhere when it gets published. And uh, I, I always thought that was such a wonderful experience that I wanted to give back. Um, teaching high school, actually, especially even if you're a professional, let's say you're whatever qualification you are in science, it's actually generally not something you can go and do. You'd have to actually go in most high schools to get a teaching degree, um, with, not without good reason, um, but I happen to uh, be able to teach at a private school where I don't have that separate need for that qualification. And so I've been teaching um, there for more than 11 years at a private school, girl school actually, uh, where I have my own science course and it's kind of like after school. Uh, and I've got students and we just work on projects. Uh, my last students, they won uh, just recently some uh, award at a college science fair. Uh, for the work that they did. So I've been privileged to do that. I've chaired a uh, foundation, uh, Software Carpentry, which is one of the largest groups of um, a volunteer, uh, volunteer organization now called the Carpentries uh, that provides training to scientists all over the world. I founded a community um, and actually got an award from NSF um, a year or so ago regarding my work for trying to help other people who do this type of training to train biologists and scientists. I've been a science advisor um, to projects at NIH, uh, at Elixir, which is the European bioinformatics infrastructure in Australia. Um, I, I also last year was uh, selected as a National Academy of Sciences Frontier Science Fellow. So all these different things that are possible if you're really interested in something uh, and you pursue it, um, whatever your background is. Um, so think about the, that, you know, there's many different uh, paths to wherever you wanna go. 
not always the most direct path, not always uh, the path that you might think it is. So uh, that just happened to me, may not happen to you. you can consider 90% of it random chance, and I'd be fine with that. Uh, and maybe I put 10% in and if that was what was needed and got me at least this far, okay, I'm okay with that. So uh, kind of, that's that's nice. I told you, you have, if that was all boring to you, uh, that's fine. I hope I will present more of the story now. Um, but a lot of my work is really about helping faculty and students get the skills that they need. And this is kind of, if you could call it my day-to-day -day job, because only a small percentage of my day-to-day -day job is actually maybe doing something like teaching. Uh, it's a lot of little things that add up to hopefully this goal. Um, many of you have heard or seen this metaphor. It's not the best metaphor, but okay, it, it has some validity to it. The idea of you know STEM, which I assume if you're uh, you know attending this uh, this uh, talk, you have some interest in one of the STEM uh, disciplines. But as you look, you know, lots of people are interested in STEM or potentially um, looking for careers and more learning in STEM. And that starts really big in high school. And then as we start to get further and further from that, um, there's very few that actually graduate in, with that degree. And this is now just talking about the undergrad, uh, undergraduate degree, and we didn't get to graduate school and other things, other forms of training. Um, and it's an interesting case, interesting situation. So for example, I love these quotes, but when you work in STEM, um, you know, not that other jobs don't change, but there are some, you know, data and some, you know, findings and about what, what it means to have a career in STEM. And what it happens is in STEM, uh, basically you really have to be a lifelong learner. Um, the skills that we need to do our job if we're working in the sciences or in any of the STEM fields, uh, they get stale quickly. Like we have to retrain ourselves um, and that happens more frequently. And in fact, uh, you will always see that you know, people saying, we need more STEM graduates in the, in the US. You know, we need more of this, more of that. But as it turns out from this particular research piece uh, that it's not the, it's not the STEM uh, graduates themselves that are a shortage. It's actually STEM graduates who have skills that they need and can get the training they need to uh, keep to keep up with those skills. So uh, you may learn a set of things, but as those skills as those skills change, if you don't change with them, uh, then you can't get you know the ne the next job or maybe the promotion you're looking for. And so um, that's what causes this sense of shortage. So uh, this report um, from 2019 said that it's the new STEM skills that are scarce. It's not the workers themselves. So um, in a sense, I kind of sensed that and I and reacted to that in different ways uh, in, in thinking about how can, what's, what's my job or how do I help this? But the key point is that, is that you know, we have wonderful, talented people, but we don't always serve them with the skills that they need in order to um, keep pace with the changes that they experience. Um, you know, so as a biologist and as many biologists, I think experience, you know, we go to school and we're trained in certain things like maybe looking down a microscope if we're biologists, that might be one thing we're trained in. Um, but often, you know, there's other sets of skills that may not, may not have been part of our undergraduate experience. Bioinformatics is not part of my formal undergraduate training. It was stuff that I learned myself or taught myself. Um, you know, all of a sudden when, when we're told that our research, we need something new or something different. Wow, you know, that's a little bit of culture shock uh, that, we have to, that we have to deal with, okay? Um, so how have I responded or, you know, what do I know about this? And this is some of my own work. This is a group that I've worked with. In fact, we had a meeting today because we're trying to do some new stuff. Uh, this is the network for um, integrating bioinformatics into life science education. And we actually did uh, some work to find out what were faculty members, like the people who are you know, teaching your courses, what are they experiencing when it comes to trying to bring some of these new skills so that when you graduate, uh, you feel better prepared for the types of uh, you know, work or the types of skills you may need to do the work. Um, so we conducted a survey a little while back uh, and we got about uh, 1,200 faculty um, 
answering questions about what does it mean to integrate these skills into edu undergraduate education. And what we found is that 95% of faculty say, hey, yeah, you're right. Um, these are definitely skills, these bioinformatics skills, the ability to use biology um, and computing to do that and understand that bio biology and biological data is really important. 95% of faculty say, yes, it's great. We need that. But only 32% of faculty actually said they did that. So it means that uh, you stand a pretty good chance wherever you're sitting that you may not be getting all of the skills that your, your faculty, uh, your, your teachers, your instructors would like to give you or think that you should give you. And there's various reasons for that. We wanted to find out why, with the hope, of course, seeing, seeing if we can address that. Um, the largest um, barrier reported by quarter of faculty as to why they feel they, they are not giving these skills to their students, which includes you, many of you, if you're one of the college students, is that they feel they don't have the expertise and training in order to bring these skills to you in a way that they would like. Um, they also feel they don't have the time uh, that's needed to get those trainings or to include in the curriculum. There's so there's many different barriers that these faculty face. Um, we also found that um, faculty members who were from underrepresented groups experienced these, uh, reported these barriers at a higher rate than their non uh, underrepresented peers. And in fact, um, this is a little bit hard to look at because there are lots of different things, but each one of these colored circles um, represents uh, a group of faculty and um, there are some traits or there are some things uh, that are associated with this. And in this particular way that we're looking at this chart, um, the faculty at the sort of uh, the orangish, orangish uh, color here, the circle, our faculty who are at you know, community colleges, associate granting degrees, uh, where they are more likely to be different from other faculty groups in terms of saying that they don't have the training, they're, that's much more likely to happen. Uh, to say that they're teaching, that, that in their teaching, they're not really able to, to integrate this in the way that they would. Uh, and then the other institution types like an undergraduate where they grant um, baccalaureates, or where they grant uh, some small, some master's degrees, and then finally at the doctoral granting institutions lie along a different continuum. So you certainly could be at a doctoral institution and not getting it, but you're much more likely if you are at some of the other institutions. And for minority serving institutions, again, they're, they're out here. Um, the other thing that was interesting that we found is that when your faculty, when your instructor or when your teacher got their degree um, has something to do with, um, both how likely is it that they got training and how likely is it that they're bringing it in the classroom. And what we found was that the faculty who got their degree earlier, so someone who got their highest degree, their PhD in the 80s, early just before the 90s, it's very unlikely they got any kind of training in bioinformatics, but about 35% of them actually bring it into the classroom. So clearly they've self-taught, you know, they've gotten their skills up. But faculty members who are newer so who graduated 2010 to 16, they are more likely to get formally trained in bioinformatics, but they're actually the least likely group to bring that into the classroom. Um, we are doing follow-up work now to kind of try to figure out why, but part of that may be a little bit of a broken educational system where sometimes uh, introducing new uh, and difficult things can be risky for new faculty because they rely uh, especially if they have a tenure system, they rely on student evaluations. And if you students say that they didn't do such a great job teaching this new and technical thing that they already didn't feel too confident in teaching, um, maybe they're less likely to bring it to the classroom because there's more risk to them. And as they get older and then they've, they've got their feet uh, sort of grounded, they feel more comfortable introducing skills that are a little bit more complex. But um, it's okay, even if the students don't take to it the first time, they're not as vulnerable to uh, tenure decisions and other things that might sort of affect their record. That's just a hypothesis. We don't know, um, but we're trying to figure out and, and also you know, see if we can, if that is correct, if we can do something to make those um, decisions less risky and so that we, we don't take decades to transform our education uh, so that these skills bring, uh, come to you. Um, this chart is basically saying the same thing, that the group in 2010 and 2016 doesn't overlap uh, in the same way. That's so this time this purple group, uh, 2010 to 16 degrees uh, doesn't overlap in the same way the other ones largely sort of overlap. They're largely the same. 
Um, we've also done uh, work to look at high school. So this is going back really earlier. I might be, maybe won't spend as long on these slides, but what we find is that you know, there are things that we used to do better that we don't do as well now. Um, so we asked uh, high school teachers about, um, you know, what they what they bring into the classroom, and um, teachers, uh, faculty in uh, 1998 felt that there were, you know, there were things like they didn't have the right lab equipment or they didn't have as much time as they would like, but um, faculty that are from 2018. Uh, so 10 years later, they feel that they can't in innovate in their classroom, not so much because they don't have the materials, but because maybe um, they don't have uh, the, you know, the class sizes that they need that they feel comfortable with, or the textbooks aren't up to date, or they feel that the textbooks are out of date, or they don't have support from parents and students is a big one, um, because maybe parents and students aren't paying as much attention to the details of their uh, high school students' education. In fact, not from this data, but what I found and recall elsewhere is that students um, in some countries, um, the, the parents are much more likely to put emphasis on science and math education. And some of you may come from different cultural backgrounds where that's the case. I was talking to a mother the other day and her son is from Jamaica or, but she's, well, they're, they're from Jamaica. And she was telling me that, you know, her daughter wanted to be a doctor and sometimes she didn't even have lunch. Uh, she didn't have, you know, food, <laughs> but she went to school every day and that her son will be coming to my course, uh, even if he has to take the train two hours to do it. Uh, so clearly she says education is really, really important to her and, and, and immigrants in general tend to have um, that view of education, whereas Americans who might feel a little bit more comfortable tend to say, okay, they're taking science and math. It's all right, it's enough. They don't have to stretch themselves. So it can happen, right? There are cultural factors, other factors that may influence our perceptions of um, education and its value. Um, so yeah, 2018, they felt um, a different set of constraints. Um, this is also uh, showing that faculty from 2000, you know, recent faculty, 2018, uh, are less likely to, to belong to professional societies like National Science Teachers Association, National Association of Biology Teachers, et cetera. And so they don't have as many um, professional development activities uh, as the teachers did in 1998. So in other words, if you were a teacher in 1998, um, like my high school biology teacher, he probably went to and had benefited from a lot more training of here's a new technology, here's a new teaching method. And it seems like we're not doing that as much you know, in recent decades. And there could be many reasons. I can't speak to all of them. But uh, I can certainly ask, how do we fix this and what do we do? Um, so one of the things that we do, and, and I'm going to get to the, you know, back to Cold Spring Harbor and Learning Center, is we really believe that um, research and education are a spectrum. It's, uh, we want you as, as students, as learners, to not think of yourselves as just you know, a passive learner, but actually someone who can participate and contribute to research, that it's on a spectrum, it's blurry, the, the distinction between these things. And in biology in particular, one of the advantages that you have is that you can work with the same data and the same, at the same time and with the same tool as research scientists. Um, you can't say this as much for every other science. Some, some places you can, some places you can't, but. Um, by and large, a lot of biology and the data of biology, certainly if you look on that side, is really accessible to you. Anybody with a computer and website can go on and really open themselves up to what biologists are doing and even train themselves to do things. So you may find that your current um, educational setting and, and offers some opportunities, but there may be other opportunities you'd like to explore. And yes, you can of course get to those in formal training, but maybe there's stuff even now that you can pursue uh, in addition to get what you want. So as I mentioned, I'm at Cold Spring Harbor. Um, this is a nice uh, painting of the lab. It's uh, looks, that's what it looks like. I could find photos, uh, but it's been around since 1890. And actually it's pretty, it's actually <laughs> by citations in terms of the number of P, uh, scientists who cite the work uh, done at Cold Spring Harbor, it's the number one scientific institution in the world. And I don't mean that in just biology. Uh, if you look at the citation counts and how, you know, whether you compare physics or astronomy or all of the sciences, for its size, it's really this sort of 
uh, juggernaut in terms of biology. And that was, that's, I think, the 2019 rating. I think the, I think, I think they do it every four years, the last time we were number one as well. So it's this really interesting place. Of course, if you go five minutes from here, no one will know what it is. They know there's a fish hatchery, but Long Island is very insular. I don't know how it is sort of south of San Francisco, but you go one other neighborhood over and it's like, I've never been there before. I don't know what it is. Or I grew up on this side of the block and that's on the other side and they don't go that far. Or maybe it's just New York. But um, it's this really cool place that I'm privileged to work at about 16 years. And at the Learning Center, we really focus on that idea of learners as being active and involved in research activities and involved in the same tools that a researcher will do. So we provide hands-on education, molecular biology and bioinformatics, starting from grades six to 12. And then um, a lot of what I do is the, uh, is the training for faculty um, and other things that are aimed more at the undergraduate level. Um, we, uh, amongst all of the things that we do, um, pre-COVID, of course, uh, we see more than 30,000 students in the local area that come for field trips and for summer camps. Um, we have different research opportunities, but then we also reach people through our online presence, our kits uh, that are used and distributed by different companies. Um, so there's really, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of students a year that get exposed to some um, product that we create at the Learning Center. And so again, for a very small place, the Learning Center is just one building at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. We're impacting, you know, half a million students every year. Uh, and that starts to add up in terms of being able to say, you know, science is something you can do. You can put your hands around it. You can explore it uh, in a really active a way that's also engaging and fun. Um, we're also, you know, international in the sense that there are many groups that we've worked with to launch similar science centers and or that we run directly. So the newest one is in Nigeria, um, and the biggest one outside of the United States is in China, in Suzhou. So these are all different places that we've had, uh, you know, with this sort of impact on um, hands-on science education in biology and genetics. Um, now I'm going to focus into sort of these opportunities and challenges, but you know, mostly opportunities, uh, because I mentioned the idea of computation is really um, at least for me and, and maybe for some of you, a really door to unlocking and, and dealing with uh, the ability to make use of, of what we see in biology. Um, you, if you, if you really don't know it really, it's hard to appreciate it when you're living in the middle of a revolution that a revolution is going on, right? Um, I think uh, nowadays, if you turn on the news, you know, any event for the past several years and even now and next year, you don't know when that, you know, something is going to happen that really is an event for the history books. Um, but you are living in, an, a, a, in a revolution as far as biology, uh, and we see that in many ways, but just to quickly um, bring you into that context, uh, if you think about astronomy as a science, the very first telescope was Lippershey. Uh, Galileo improved on it, but he was still after Lippershey, and that's in 1608, right? Uh, he probably took his notes in a, um, a notebook uh, using, you know, handwritten recordings and drawings. Um, to go from that, uh, in terms of the amount of data that he generated, the amount of observations he had, to something like the Kepler telescope, which I picked because it gave me a nice round number. Uh, it's a, it was, a, you know, a nice space telescope. So that, that took about 400 years to get um, that much progress to go from that. Um, in biology, the very first sequence of our, you know, information molecules of RNA and DNA is in the 1960s, uh, late 1960s, early 1970s, handwritten notes, documents, photographs of, you know, these first, you know, the whole output of uh, the world's biological sequence is, you know, written in, you know, tens of bases, right? It was weeks long to generate a few nucleotides of DNA sequence data. Um, no one could have dreamed, let alone, let's say, Watson, who later went on to uh, uh, help lead the Human Genome Project and was obviously, you know, alive at that at that time, still alive now. Uh, you know, the, the idea of generating a human genome uh, might have seemed like something that would be a, another generation away, right? Uh, Forty years instead of four hundred years later, you have these first. Uh, genome sequencing machines 
that were able to, you know, do more than generate the human genome, right? That you could uh, do uh, now in days and, and today in hours, what took a decade to do <coughs> and when the first human genome came out um, in early 2000, uh, 2000, 2003, right? We can do 10 years of work in a few hours and I can have a high school student generate it, you know, just a couple of hours, um, not too much money, okay? Um, there's this paper that I like about big data and, and thinking about, we use the term astronomical, but this was genomical saying that, and sorry to trash on astronomers, uh, this whole talk somehow uh, had the deepest respect for that science, but they're saying, you know, we use the word astronomical to mean big, but here they're saying, you know, biological data is going to be much bigger uh, in some respects than um, but the astronomical data. You know, if you go onto the sequence read archive of NCBI, which is a, the National Library of Medicine's uh, data repository at NIH, you're talking about quadrillions of bases of, of DNA data that's generated and that tells there. So unimaginable amounts of data. And we're still just getting started and cracking uh, the code. Um, and, and we've, you know, it's just, it's just hard to come up with seeing this other than you know, real life example of, you know, the, the whole story of COVID and the vaccine being able now uh, to come out with a vaccine within a year. Now, there was more than a decade of work behind the vaccine um, to generate, you know, this whole really idea of having a stable RNA that you could transfect somebody with. It was a long time in coming. But if you can imagine that this amazing amount of progress has, has, has happened with COVID and COVID is gonna stimulate a lot of things, right? This technology was unproven. It could have taken another 10 or 20 years be before people would you know, move it through clinical trials at, at the normally slow pace. But that same technology is now going to be applied to cancer. Vaccines for cancer. Uh, cancer is really difficult. Sorry, my talk wasn't about this, but and I have no slides to support it. But cancer, uh, one of the things it does, like a virus, is it mutates, right? 50% uh, of cancers after uh, a given treatment will um, uh, attain a mutation that makes them resistant, right? If we can, in hours, design a new um, antigen, a vaccine, to target a novel mutation in cancer or, or target um, diseases that have been very difficult uh, to d develop uh, uh, vaccines for, that's going to be a game changer. Anyway, um, back to education. Um, this is tough because if you were a molecular biologist in the 1980s, you'd be uh, new technologies in your hands would be things like polymerase chain reaction, PCR, um, looking at ref ref uh, restriction fragments in 1990s, 2000s. It's microarrays and, and RNA interference. And now uh, this 10, 2010, it's CRISPR and RNA-seq and all these different things, right? Um, actually, although we have these lovely new technologies, they are fairly linear. Uh, some of them are revolutionary. CRISPR is revolutionary. But the concepts behind them, these sort of um, techniques that we'd use to new, do them, if, if you uh, had a frozen scientist from 1980 who was uh, using PCR, and then I, I, I revived this scientist and I told them about CRISPR and asked them to go in the lab and do CRISPR, probably in two weeks they would be able to do it because it's the same sort of idea of what molecular biology is and I need reagents and I need to measure things in millimoles and you know, the, 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 um, the, the concepts are largely related and you can train yourself and you could probably do a good job and, and be right working with the best of them. But if you look at the, the technologies and the conceptual approaches for data, it's very different. You in the 1980s would be talking about word processing. Um, you, you might have your lecturers who grew up where you needed to uh, reserve time on the, on the typewriter to type out their thesis. But later it became that you had a word processor and you could uh, you know, edit documents electronically. Um, but that's also how you would think about recording sequence data and publishing, you know, today, many of you maybe in the audience have sequenced something, a few hundred base pairs, right? That would have been a thesis and a PhD um, in, the, in the 80s. Now, um, but if you look at data in 1990s, we're talking about BLAST and databases and, and, the, and the origins of big data biology. And then now when you come to us, there's a humongous skill gap because these data 
skills are diverging and getting further apart and like not at all related to your skills that you got in, in college still, which would be word processing. And still today, we graduate plenty of biologists who have touched the blast, they've touched that button, but they haven't done more. So how are they at all prepared for uh, HPC computing and machine learning and big data challenges? Now, it's not that you're gonna use those in every single aspect of biology directly yourself, but they do it. <laughs> they basically do impact every area of biology. Uh, and to some extent or another. And you may need to use uh, one or more of those in whatever combination in order to do your work. So it's a big thing. So what's our approach to solving this in the classroom? Well, we have a couple of requirements when we think about designing educational approaches that can help students do this. And we think that these are effective. The first one is to not teach uh, com computational biology by itself, usually. Some students, they love it. Um, that's their thing, they're self-selected and they get right into it, but that's not necessarily the majority. What we actually find is that if we mix our experiences where part of the problem, part of the challenge is a hands-on wet lab, things you're used to, um, that kind of uh, biology, and then you mix it with computational biology, like, okay, well, we generated some data, but now we need to analyze those data that having that hook where students can get their hand on something and dig into a problem and care about it, and then have to work to struggle to say, okay, how do I understand the data? That's really effective. The other thing we like to do is that, you know, someone needs to care about the data. If you've done a lab and, you know, you all, we've all done labs, I think, where you're doing the lab, you got to get the grade, you got to press past the practical, the final, and yes, that's okay. But um, you know, once you're done, all of those materials or that data gets thrown out because it's the 30th time someone's done this type, well, 3,000th time someone's done this titration. We know what happens. It turns pink or it turns clear. Um, that was no surprise. But if you could actually be working as a high school student, as a, as a college student on a project that actually people care about what the data is, that's very powerful. And so having a partnership with scientists or Having projects that can lead to publications, those are really things that we love to try to do. And then also having projects that lots and lots of people can join in. Uh, it makes it a lot of fun and it adds that element of collaboration, which is an essential scientific skill. So the last story I'll tell you there is, the, is about one project that we do that, which is DNA barcoding. And it's worked really, really well, which is essentially getting um, people to identify um, unknown plants, animals, food samples, through their DNA and it's real science, it scales, it touches on uh, dozens of concepts, uh, it combines wet lab activities with bioinformatics and it's accessible. Um, so students go out, they collect foods or herbal medicines or living specimens and they go through this process of extracting DNA, getting the sequences and then just doing this data analysis. And it can be done by students starting in high schools when we normally would expose them with you know low cost materials. It doesn't take that much to get started. Um, so we, we've eliminated a lot of the things. And then the amount of time that you need to do an extraction or a PCR is all very reasonable for the classroom. Um, those data that students, excuse me, the train is coming through, this is the 808 here. Um, we provide them with the DNA sequence and then that goes to a graphical uh, platform we designed to make it easy to interpret and analyze those data. Um, so we use this in several projects here where we are in New York City and Long Island area. It's been done elsewhere. Um, we've collaborated, but it works well there. Um, I won't go in so much into the workflows of this particular tool, but this particular tool handles barcoding, RNA-seq, microbiomes. Um, so it's really this rich um, set of uh, analyses in a very simple interface, powered by a whole bunch of collaborators and technologies that go into it. Um, websites to help people organize and analyze this data. You know, these are data that naturalists and ecologists can actually come back and use. And in fact, we publish these data uh, sequences on NCBI and also in some cases, scientific publications. And we often find things that no one has looked for or found. Um, this gives you an idea of uh, how many students have been involved in these research projects and how much data we've generated. I'm just going through this uh, relatively quickly, um, but I wanted to at least touch on like a real example. When we first did this the very first year we had uh, sort of a little competition and we still have a symposium every year. These were the winners um, from a high school, public high school in the Bronx. 
who are looking at ginkgo supplements. So, you know, you go to the drugstore, maybe, I don't know what ginkgo is supposed to be good for, maybe stress, uh, and you buy some ginkgo tablets thinking, okay, this is for my health. Well, what they found when they looked at every tablet and every capsule and every tea that they could find is that almost none of the samples that were labeled as ginkgo actually contained any ginkgo DNA that they could find. Uh, so they went through drug stores, they went to herbal medicine shops and all of the places they took out and, and, and looked at the powder or the crushed leaf. And it was mostly rice powder, grass, other things, no ginkgo, uh, right? You can imagine, right, a ginkgo, what does that look like in a capsule? How would you know? And these findings were later um, confirmed by the attorney general of the state of New York that they also looked at products and saw that they were basically, you know, um, not true. So these are things that high school students can do and that you could do. Uh, that really are real science and really capture all those elements. And they had to learn not only the wet lab, they had to learn the data in order to do things like that. So it's just a message that everyone can contribute, right? Um, yeah, that's another thing that we're doing now. We're looking at uh, problems in metabarcoding. So looking at populations of microbes and things like that. So there are all these interesting things. Um, another example, again, uh, looking at this other technology called RNA sequencing. These are all projects that we've turned into resources for faculty to bring these into the classroom. Um, this is just giving you an idea of what some of this, these interfaces like RNA-seq looks like, where people can look at the quality of their DNA results and they can um, you know, you know, do all sorts of trimming and filtering and, and blah, 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 blah. It's a detail. Um, we can point you to those resources if you wanna learn more about uh, how do you analyze the activity of genes looking through uh, this particular tool? Maybe the only thing here to focus on, since there's so many blurry things going across the screen, is that it's an interface that's simple to use for somebody who um, doesn't know how to do code and work at the command line, that they can get list of genes uh, from a sample to see, uh, you know, in a cancer versus a tumor, a uh, tumor versus a normal cell, are different levels of genes being expressed at different uh, rates. And those are the clues to tell you what's going on and what's important. Um, we've done this with other groups. So I, I'm working on one other project for geno genomics education. It's a similar thing where we give people a whole bunch of tools to go ahead uh, and work with these tools in order uh, to uh, really understand. And, and this actually starts again, this is, uh, if you haven't done any of this stuff, don't worry, uh, the details aren't important. But maybe the one thing I could touch on here is, is that um, as we start getting into these technologies, you start getting exposed to things like using Docker and using GitHub and using R and shiny apps on R and Jupyter and all of these different things. And what you're doing, even though, quote unquote, you are a biologist or were, um, is you're actually now really within the data scientist toolkit. Um, and so I think many of you uh, know that data science is an important buzzword in terms of finding a job. Um, here you are as a biologist who's able now to start working in data science. And I think that's amazing and fantastic because like it or not, um, there's only a limited number of jobs out there. If biology is your true passion, I want you to go, you know, continue after it. But you may really love biology, um, but it may not be the only choice you're interested in. Or you may really love biology, but maybe the particular area of biology or that you were looking to get a job in isn't really that productive right now. Well, you can imagine that if you are a biologist, but yet you have a, a grounding in the data science toolkit, there are many places that you can um, Find, uh, find job opportunities. And so this is a really interesting way to think about learning about biology is also preparing you for other careers, much to the chagrin of some biologists that I know because we have definitely had biologists lose uh, students and employees who went off and become bankers and Wall Street financiers because they knew math and statistics that they learned in biology. So it's just showing you that, you know, things are connected in ways that may not always be obvious. Uh, so this slide is, is, is not, is, uh, wasn't exactly meant to tell that story, but I thought that might be the aspect of it to say that's useful uh, to this audience. Um, the other thing about computational uh, work in biology is that, you know, it's really, when I said that the same tools are accessible to you as everyone else, it's really true in biology. If you look at some of the other sciences, uh, my last chance to uh, trash physics here and astronomy, 
um, major discoveries in physics, at least in particle physics, are, are coming around uh, really large experiments that are, you know, in a single place. Like, okay, the Large Hadron Collider generates a petabyte, petabyte of data per day, um, per second, I'm sorry. One of, you know, they, they throw away most of the data actually, uh, but they keep the collisions that are interesting. And then they, they, they have that data and they generate their publications. If you pay attention to science news, the G minus two experiment uh, for the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon uh, at Fermilab was the, that was the news story a couple of weeks back, and that's another big experiment. Uh, astronomy, they look at you know observations where you need to actually get time on a telescope, and whether it's radio astronomy or other forms of astronomy, it revolves around these gigantic instruments, which you as a as a student may not have access to. Um, those data sets or be able to start working with them in any user friendly way. In biology, we're going the opposite direction. It used to be popular. Um, this uh, picture on the left, when we go to a biology conference, uh, popular enough that somebody put a map of who has a DNA sequencer. And so you would go to a conference and the numbers of DNA sequencers would be put on the map. You wanted your pin saying, yeah, we have one, or this is the only one in Australia, or this is the only one, or we've got three of them now in Argentina, whatever it was, right? You, you people are fascinated by it. But today, when we think about DNA sequencing, we may just well mean this little minion DNA sequencer, which can do the same stuff better than the sequencers of 2012 uh, on something that's smaller than your cell phone, plugs into your laptop with USB. We can do that, right? So what that means for you as a learner, as a student, is that you could do this at home. Um, I don't necessarily mean literally, maybe you're an entrepreneur, but it means that you have these opportunities to work with data and tools as a, as a student that really uh, is just you know, something to think about that you can take advantage of. Um, so yeah, I made that idea. And, and all of those things that allow you to operate independently you know, taking those data, working on the cloud, again, data science toolkit things, those are all things that you have access to now. Final message, I got to wrap this up and leave time for questions is that, um, you know, all of these things may sound like technology and, and lots of them are and learning, but I also point out that, that tremendously important to this is the idea of community and collaboration and communication. Um, what, uh, I, you know, what I also try to build and part of my work is building what we call community of practice. And, and it sounds simple and in some levels it is. Community of practice is groups of people who share concern or passion for something. And they, um, you know, learn how to do it better as they interact. Some of you might have a study group and it's kind of essentially the same thing, but for scientists or professionals in this sort of uh, circumstance. So uh, one of these things that I did was create this group called Lifeside Trainers. And by creating a group means, hey, you know, I started a Slack channel and then, you know, got a couple hundred people to join and now have, you know, monthly calls and we uh, are working on our first publication together and we are trying to uh, do surveys. So these are examples of, you know, a lot of these technologies not only would help you do research in the lab, but also connect with other people who share your interests and that you can build into something that no one created before. It's really much more possible today than it is, uh, than it was, right? Um, so my take home message on that end is that technologies will always scale, people will be working on them, but um, you really wanna think about scaling people and communities, whether that's scaling yourself, improving yourself or improving your community um, because that's uh, the key to everything that I've shown you. It doesn't work without all of those things. And they're sometimes hidden. They're not necessarily the fancy, th fancy things. They, they feel soft and fuzzy, but they're absolutely critical. Um, so I'll finish with a quote um, from Alan Toffler, who said that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And it's something that I think is uh, words of wisdom uh, given that, you know, we really need to uh, think about education as a lifelong uh, career spanning process. So with that said, I am going to stop my sharing here. If I find my button, I've moved things around on my screen so much that things are in the same place. So let me stop sharing. And with that, um, I'm open to getting in the focus if my camera decides it can focus and then see if I can take more questions. It'll eventually focus on me, but uh, all right. So I think I see the chat. 
and I'm going to start with whatever I see there. And um, you can certainly chat, uh, chat questions until we're out of time, but I'm then going to I'm going to start with the chat. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so I can get things and try to go to them. OK, 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 OK. Ah, OK, so my first question that's there is why aren't there more places trying to implement the hands on experience that CSHL offers since it's so beneficial other schools working on implementation. So yeah, I would don't want you to think by any means that we're the only one. We're not at all. There's many different places that work on um, hands on science um, and, and doing that. In fact, in, in your area, there's something called BABEC, which is the Bi Area Biotechnology um, Consortium, I believe. It's the last C and they work on um, these types of problems. I think I would like to think that the Learning Center had a hand in in uh, spurring on and stimulating at least some of these groups, but we're certainly not the only one. Um, what I would say is unique about Cold Spring Harbor and some of the things that we've done is one, we benefit from this rich uh, scientific heritage. Uh, you know, as I said, it's this this really you know a heavy hitting institution visited by thousands of scientists every year. And the other thing is, is that we don't have, we don't have undergraduates. We have about, you know, 12 you know, graduate students, 12 to 15 graduate students entered into our graduate school per year. There are others who are either already there or doing rotations from other universities. But because we don't have the students locally in that sense as other places do, we had to branch out and we had to think nationally. So oftentimes when we do projects or we think about things, we're thinking on a national scale. And so in some ways, our, our way of dissemination might be noticeable or notable uh, like that. So that's one element of it uh, that I think may be uh, part of uh, our success there. Um, okay, let's see. How does a biology student learn about databases? What classes do people need to take and things like that? So thinking about biological databases and biology and things like that. One thing I'll say is that uh, be careful because there may not be a class in something that you wanted to do, um, but let's just talk about getting started. Um, the very first thing to do to get started, uh, obviously you're gonna take some type of intro biology course, but really it may depend on where you are at and what is offered is there a course or an elective called bioinformatics? If there is, then probably they're gonna cover some of this stuff. If there's not any apparent course called bioinformatics, the next question is, are the faculty uh, where you're at studying, um, do they integrate some of this stuff? Do they in incorporate bioinformatics? Um, what if they don't, or maybe it's not as much as you want? Really, the, um, the cool thing is that um, these things are largely online. so. Uh, you, you, you know, a database and, and, and like the, those elements of it, um, you know, that's a very specific question as to what a biological database is, but maybe a starting point in terms of formal education that almost everyone would find is, a, is an introductory, it, it could be an introductory course in computer science, um, but um, more often than not, it will, be a, it will be a course on coding or things like Python Oftentimes libraries at schools give these. The, the, the caveat and the danger that would warn you away from Computer Science 101 is because often as Computer Science 101 is taught as a weed or the introductory computer science course at a university is often a weed course. It's meant to kick out people who are going to go to really become computer scientists, which may not be what you want. Uh, you may not be going that track. So you may wanna make sure and you check the curriculum or talk with those offering to see, will it be useful to you? There are joint courses in introductory computer science, which are completely uh, accessible and designed for non-majors in computer science, but just be a little bit careful. In terms of just raw sort of what kind of skills do you want? Um, uh, if you're wanting to develop these computational skills, you're almost certainly gonna wanna little, learn a little bit about how to code. Very often that's gonna be something like R or Python um, which are the most popular ones in biology. And YouTube is probably your best friend because there will be lots of learn biology online, introductory biology online. So those are things to try to, um, to think about. Um, and I hope that you, you know, if you have those interests, you do. Um, let's see, let's see. In terms of like, you know, instructors getting the skills that they want to move forward, oftentimes, uh, Resources, of course, are we, we have training courses at the DNA Learning Center um, that 
are accessible on a national basis. There's probably even some going up now that are new, so check out our website. But professional societies like National Science Teachers and National Association of Biology Teachers often are a great resource for finding some of this coursework. Um, and then at the collegiate level, even more, you know, finding, um, looking up colleagues at a larger institution if your institution isn't that research focused and seeing, you know, some of them are working with either other colleges and or would be open to things like that or even contacting faculty there. Um, so those would be examples. All right, let me try to move on to some more questions. Students pursuing health majors and have to take many STEM classes. Um, are MDs uh, and MDs medical doctors, they consider scientists. So probably not by scientists, uh, but that's not 100% true. Um, so there is certainly a degree in MD, PhD, where as an MD, you will um, have like a really a research thesis or research topics that you're working on. But um, definitely there are MDs that focus more on the research and more on the science side. So there are plenty of people who, are, who got an MD, but then moved on and really focused solely on research. So it's not to say that you can't make that decision later. Um, so there are lots of places where that happened. Uh, one of the most famous and early computational biologists, Lincoln Stein, who was at Cold Spring Harbor is now Ontario, you know, that is an MD. Um, at NIH, people even like, if you think about a Dr. Fauci, who's an MD, but as clearly a researcher, right? So just by the title MD, um, as scientists first instinct may not be to think of you as a scientist, but if you do research, um, you're a scientist, even if you, uh, whatever degree you have. So I think that's probably what I would say to who's a scientist and who's not, we don't wanna have gates, um, but I can at least tell you what people would assume or might imagine. Um, and, and definitely as a health, um, you know, in the health sciences, these computational things are important because as we develop treatments or new technologies, even in molecular biology, often doctors aren't versed in these. Um, they don't know, they're just trying, you know, get wrap their heads around personalized medicine and all of those predictions of personalized medicine are gonna have their route or have their origins in bioinformatics uh, and analyses, predictions, things like that. So totally two things that are very compatible. Um, okay. What's the most surprising thing I've learned so far? I don't know where to begin with that. Um, maybe the most surprising thing that I've learned so far, if I just tried to pick one of something I alluded to earlier, is that, you know, um, hopefully if you work at a nice institution, no matter who you are, somebody who has a good idea should be able to get that idea um, moving. There are a number of times, the very first thing, I, one of the very first things I did at Cold Spring Harbor was um, I loved science fairs and doing them in high school. I thought they were fun. And um, when I moved beyond high school, anytime I got a chance to judge a science fair, I would always do that. And I realized going to a science fair and judging it um, and being on the other side of the trifold, so to speak, that, hey, a lot of the students weren't really getting their projects. And in fact, actually, as I came to think about it, most, science, most students, um, do a science fair project, but they've never actually seen a professional science fair, which is what we call a symposium or poster session. So I just talked to the people in meetings and courses and said, hey, we should invite high school students to come see the meetings and the courses because they get to see the lab sometimes, but they don't actually ever see scientists presenting their work in the form of a talk, in the form of a poster. And they said, yeah, you're right. And we should do that. And you know, I thought to myself, walking down the street, I remember where I was, that hey, you know, Cold Spring Harbor has been here since 1890, and I just changed how this institution works. It wasn't life changing, but I changed how it works. And so, uh, I think that um, you know, people can listen to your ideas. And if you're at a place where people aren't listening to your ideas, maybe you want to try to leave that place. But just uh, recognizing that, you know, if you have a good idea and there's merit behind it. Uh, in academia, you know, it should be listened to and you can do that. And no matter who you are, you can change uh, the way that things are going. Um, not in every circumstance, but, you know, maybe more than you might think. So that's what I thought uh, maybe is my answer to that. <clears throat> All right, looking at this, looking to see if there's anything else. Okay, I see people talking about CRISPR and wanted to get more into that, so that's great. 
So I don't see any other questions. And actually the clock puts this like exactly on the time that we're supposed to finish. Uh, is there anything else, Nick? No, oh, Jason, um, <clears throat> that's about it for me. Thank you very much for coming and talking to our students. And uh, again, we're starting out, uh, Denise Hum, who is on the talk here, uh, is starting out a data science and you may have seen that. So she's offering a math 211. And hopefully, you know, at Skyline, we don't do weed out courses. So hopefully if, if people want to take that kind of introductory to data science class, I think that would be a good one. And um, you've kind of really inspired us. And so we're going to try and get together and, and um, see if we can, uh, if I can influence her to do a little bit more biology in her class awesome. than maybe she's done before. Great. Awesome. Well, I, I hope that that goes well. It sounds like a great opportunity. Um, and I encourage everyone to pursue it and thank everybody for the opportunity to speak. Thanks very much, Nick. Thanks for helping organize Brian and to everyone else. Okay. Thank you, Maris. Thank you very much for the inspiration, Jason. Thank you. Have thank a great you. night. Bye.